Verse 9. Now, remember what the Roman Catholic Church teaches about the priest. Okay? Remember, keep that sort of thing in the back of your mind of what the Roman Catholic Church teaches about the priest. Now, here is what Peter, if he was the first pope, if the Roman Catholic Church claims Peter to be the first pope, and the Roman Catholic Church has this priesthood, which then only through the priesthood are the sacraments able to be administered, including the Eucharist, Therefore, what does this mean? Verse 9, when, when we say in 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, Basically, what Peter is teaching here is the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers. And yet, that's not what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that they have exclusive rights to the gospel. And we'll come back to uh, Matthew 2.16 to show what the Bible actually means when Peter is given the keys to open and shut. It doesn't mean to say that he opens and shuts and holds back salvation from certain groups of people and opens it to others. And so Peter taught that the only priesthood in the New Testament is that of Christ and the general priesthood of all believers. See, the Lord Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man. There is no other mediator. We don't need to have a priest. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the people came and brought their sacrifices, and the priest would, and Levitical priesthood would, would wash that uh, sacrifice, wash themselves, and present that sacrifice to God. But Christ was the final sacrifice that ended all sacrifices. So there's no need for someone to act on your behalf any longer. We have direct access to, the, to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the New Testament, Peter himself teaches that the Lord Jesus Christ is the priest, the only way to get to, you know, no one comes unto the Father but by me. And the general priesthood of all believers and yet, you see, that's not what the popes teach. The popes teach that their church, the mother church, has a special priesthood. And the only church that's able to distribute sacraments and hence salvation. So in other words, you can't be saved any other way but through the Roman Catholic Church and the sacraments. There's no other way to be saved. And remember the first entrance into the Roman Catholic Church is by Croydon baptism so babies are baptized well okay you want to use the creature they're sprinkled or poured or dipped or something poured yeah uh, unless you're Greek Orthodox and then they do you know splash them you know splash them and uh, once they're they have been Baptized, that's the first step into the entrance to the church. But of course, we've already seen last week that that doesn't, again, match scriptures. And, um, and, and I won't re rehash that. And then the second step, of course, is confirmation and then follows by... Right, confirmation, communion, the first communion, and all those, well, communion, the Eucharist. Yeah, the Eucharist. And, and of course, remember the teaching of the Eucharist. It's the actual, they, they believe that when the priest prays to the Holy Spirit, that the, the wafer, or the Eucharist, or the, the um, what do they call it, the, the host, becomes the actual body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you don't eat his body and drink 
his blood, you have no part in him. That's what they teach. But of course, that sacrifice has been finished with. And so this priesthood, there's no need now for a priesthood. We have a great mediator between God and man, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no need for any other mediator or the mediatrix, which might be Mary. So there's no other way to get to God. Let's go uh, a little bit further back to verses 4 through to 8. So if Peter was the first pope, I think he's made a, a big mistake by saying um, that the general priesthood are believers. So verses 4, so 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. To whom coming is unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones have built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto him, unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builder disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and the stone uh, of stumbling and a rock of offence, even to them that stumble at the word being disobedient, whereon whereunto also they were appointed. So, in other words, Peter talks about that. Christ is the rock upon which the church is founded. Christ is the foundation of the church. Christ is the foundation. We are, as it says in verse 5, are lively stones. We're like stones that's fitly joined together to build the church. And of course, the popes say that Peter was that rock. And this was passed on to the popes. And we'll answer this question a little bit more fully later when we examine Matthew chapter 16. And, and what does it really teach when it says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. So is the church built on Peter? And we'll look, answer that um, in the um, coming weeks. So let's turn over to First Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. <clears throat> for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Okay, hold that thought. Just go back to chapter 2 and look at verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the, on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. Okay? So in other words, Jesus Christ, he is the one that suffered for sins. He's the one that was crucified for sins and paid the penalty for man's sins. He was once suffered for sins and bear our sins in his own tree. Peter taught that. Clearly, he taught that. And yet, the popes say that Christ is sacrificed anew in each Mass. You know when they have the crucifix? What's on the crucifix? Oh, do you, have you never seen one before? I don't want to send you to a Roman Catholic church. Don't let me do that. What's on the cross? The Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. What do we have? Empty cross. We don't sacrifice Christ over and over and over again. Like they do in the Mass. 
And Christ was sacrificed once. For Christ, in verse 18 of chapter 3, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins. He doesn't have to suffer and suffer and suffer and suffer over and over again for sins. And yet that is exactly what they do. He's still on the cross. He's still on the cross. The poor guy can never get off. He rose again on the third day. So the popes say that Christ is sacrificed anew in each Mass, and having Jesus Christ and his cross is not enough. Is not enough. You've got to have the other sacraments. You've got to have all the church sacraments. All right? A believer also needs the Roman Catholic Church and the sacraments and the priest. You see how controlling the Roman Catholic Church is? Because if you don't accept their way of salvation, you're lost. Because there's no other way to be saved except, well, they say, the Roman Catholic Church. And unless you eat Christ's flesh and blood, then you have no part in them. And you're lost. Unless you're baptized, you're lost. Unless you're confirmed at the age of 13 or 14, unless you partake of your first um, Eucharist, Lord's Supper, put that in quotation marks, you're lost. You're lost. Unless you go to confession, you're lost. Unless you do penance, you're lost. Well, you're lost. You might go to purgatory. You have to... Pay a lot of money to get out of purgatory, don't you? I don't know how much how, how much have you paid. Still paying. He's still paying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how many of us came out of the of us came out of the Roman Catholic Church? I know Croydon did, and Paco did too. Yeah. Very controlling, and the popes had a huge control over kings and countries simply because of that. They withheld salvation from the people until the people riled up against the king and the king was forced to bow to the Pope's lead, whatever he wanted. So, these are all doctrines that Peter would propose in his uh, letters here. First Epistle of Peter, Second Epistle of Peter. You know, he... he put all these doctrines through, was he wrong? Was he wrong? This is God's word, right? And God can preserve his word, right? He has preserved his word. So Peter can't be wrong. Because if Peter's wrong, then this book is wrong. And if Peter's wrong, then what else in this book is wrong? And we wouldn't be able to tell. We'd have to go to the Pope and ask him, and he would have to make a statement from his throne, throne, and then we would have to bow to that. And of course, it always changes. So the mystery of the church had begun, and it was a time of grace, and no longer under Mosaic law with sacrifices. There's no more sacrifices. Paul had to correct Peter in his doctrine. So when, and we looked at this in Sunday school, adult Sunday school class, that when the Old Testament was finished, the revelation of a mystery, that of the mystery of the church, um, be, uh, came in view. And Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, Peter had been brought up a Jew, like Paul did, but the message was now the church message. It was a time of grace, no longer sacrifices, no longer feasts. The Old Testament is finished. You know, we talk about dispensations. Here are two dispensations, the Old Testament and the New Testament. People say, well, there's no, no dispensations in the Bible. Well, here's two. Here's two. And of course, the, the Old Testament never ever had seen or heard of the rapture. 
No Old Testament Jew ever looked for a rapture. And yet, the Bible talks about it. The mystery of the church. Let's go to Galatians uh, chapter 2. We see that Peter, now with this mystery, had to teach, I don't mean to, to correct Peter, but had to teach Peter about this mystery, the new uh, gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, not the gospel of the animals, uh, the sacrifices of animals, uh, but the uh, message of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. So, Galatians chapter 2. Get there. Verses 11 through to 20. Verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I, now, I, this I is, I is Paul. Paul is writing to the Galatians. Right? So he's writing to the Galatians. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before, this, before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Now, of the circumcision were the Jews, right? So he was eating with the Gentiles pretty happily, you know. Oh, look, he's having a good time about these Christians, and they're talking to Christians about, about the Lord and all those sort of things. And then he sees Jews coming, and then all of a sudden he withdraws himself. I don't want to be seen eating with those. What did the Jews call the Gentiles? It starts with D and ends in S. Dogs. Dogs. He didn't want to be seen eating with dogs. So he withdrew himself, and here... Um, we see um, Paul standing or talking to Peter, verse 13, and the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. In other words, they all just got up and walked away from these smelly Gentiles. Very sad story, really. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, what is the, what is the gospel? The gospel is his death, burial, and resurrection. To whom? To whom? All men, yes. To the Gentiles. To these Gentiles. And remember what, the, what Paul himself wrote. He says there's no Jew or Gentile, no bond or free, no male or female in the church of God. So in verse 14 again, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, in other words, born Jews, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Notice that difference here. Not justified by the works of the law. That's Old Testament. New Testament is faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, the, 
Peter was still very much tied up with the Jewish hierarchy, the people. So he had been here eating and drinking and having a, a good time until these Jews came along and he moved away uh, from them. And so Paul put him straight on that. So Peter said that the supreme political power on earth was the king and not the pope. So the pope would say he has the power. He has the authority. But Peter said that the supreme political power on earth was the king and not the pope. So let's go back to 1 Peter. Now remember, keep in mind that we're going to go back to Matthew eventually to try and sort all this out. All we're trying to do, and what I've done over the last couple of weeks, is to show the difference between what the Roman Catholic Church preaches and teaches and what Peter does. Because the Roman Catholic Church claim Peter as one of their popes. Okay? And so far we've seen that none of the doctrine that Peter holds to, in fact, he had a mother-in-law and, and uh, all those sort of things that we've already seen in some of those verses. But 1 Peter chapter 2, down to verse 13. First Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. Now the Roman Catholic Church would say the Pope is supreme. That we need to bow our authority or give our authority over to the Pope. Um, so, Peter says, no, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme. That holds unless the country violates, violates God's laws. Okay? So, we, we bow ourselves to the king, but like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we don't bow ourselves to to images. Okay? Might cost the lives. But that's what we have to do. First Peter chapter one. This is two through to five. So Peter's saying, you know, the, the power belongs with the supreme king. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 through to 5, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, capital S, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace uh, unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, which uh, that fadeth not away, preserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. Now just keep that in mind. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So Peter taught that the believer has a living hope and an inheritance reserved in heaven and can have assurance of salvation because he or she is kept by the power of God. Notice that again, verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God. And we used to say, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. Okay? So he, here we have the teaching of Peter says that we are kept by the power of God. But the popes say that a believer needs to go through purgatory and cannot know for sure that he has a home in heaven. 
cannot be sure that he has a home in heaven. Yeah, he could have left his purgatory. You've got to be ultra good, don't you? Mother you, Teresa, sorry. Mother Teresa. Has she skipped purgatory? Yep, she skipped a week of hell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, you're right. Did everybody hear that? Mother Teresa skipped purgatory. She went straight to hell. <laughs> Now, of course, that's on the video. <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> you know, my mother, she wasn't saved. She was a church person, believed in the church, and the church would get her there. And um, she was never assured of, and she said, if I'm good enough, I'll go to heaven. And even, you know, last days we would try to, to show Dad, you know, from from the Bible, that um, he said, shut your Bible and don't want to hear it. Because they don't want to open the Word of God to find out what the truth is. They want to hang on to the church's teaching. And the church's teaching will send everybody to hell. Okay? So, we need to, to be careful about what the church teaches. Because if you accept what the church teachers then you don't have a brilliant spirit to check out whether these things are so. So um, purgatory is a is a place where you where you try and work your way, get rid of those sins and all those sort of things that that, that so easily beset you on the earth, you know. And eventually if you if the church, if the people pray enough or they give enough money, you can have a shortened time in purgatory by paying more money to the church. And of course, God loves money. He wants money rather than in your souls. And you'll say, your reward is heaven if you give more money to the church. We're ashamed. Maybe we should do that too. <laughs> All right, First Peter chapter 4. Chapter 4. And verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Okay? That's what Peter teaches. Now, what has the Roman Catholic Church done over the years? In the name of Christ, in the name of the cross, they have murdered. They have stolen. They are acting as evildoers. Go to confessional box. Door slides open. No. Busybody in other people's business. So Peter taught the believer not to be a Murderer, thief, evildoer, or a busybody. And yet history shows that popes have been all of these things, especially during their inquisitions. Spanish inquisitions, all those things. They've been so cruel. It's almost like they were the uh, equivalent, the Christian equivalent of the Islam. Islam. Okay? Islam would say, I'm going to kill you if you don't turn to Islam. I'm going to, you'll lose your head. The Roman popes would say, you turn to Roman Catholicism or we kill you. Isn't that the same? So the Roman Catholic Church uses Matthew 16 through to 20 to support its idea that Peter was made pope by the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go back just to refresh our memory. So we're getting closer to finding out what does the Bible actually teach. Is it? 6.30 already. Boy, time certainly flies. So Matthew chapter 16. And beginning, we'll start at verse 16. And then we'll go down to... 
few things to look at. <clears throat> so, verse 16. Oh, well, let's pick it up from verse 13, because it, this is really the background to it. So when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And who, who do people say that I am? Okay. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Which is interesting. John the Baptist being beheaded, you know. Has he come back to life? Or is there a double? Some Elias. And others, Jeremiah's. Or one of the prophets. And he says unto them, But whom say ye that I am? So these are the people said that Christ is these people. But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Bar Simon Bar-Jonah. Now Simon Bar-Jonah is who? Peter, yeah, Peter. His his earthly name before it was changed to Peter, right? And we'll look at that in a minute because it says, For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. Now, see the change? Firstly called Simon by Jonah. Now it's Peter. First was his earthly name, now it's his heavenly name. Okay, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. See, and this is where the popes get their power from, because they believe that they have received these keys, because Peter was the first pope, so now they have the power to open and to close, to bind on earth and to bind in heaven, to open on earth and to open in heaven. Okay, and I will, verse 19 again, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he the disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So the Roman Catholic thinking is that Peter is considered to have been made, right, their thinking, we'll look at this, the rock of the church, the foundation, okay? The foundation of the church is Peter. And upon that rock, the church is built, Right? So that's their thinking. That's their thinking. Because his name is Peter and that's Greek. Yeah, yeah, we'll get, we'll get to that. Don't, don't you serve, you know, I can, if you want to. <laughs> okay, so considered to have been made the rock of the church. So, so are the successors of Peter, the Roman popes. So every succession is a new Peter, right, who has the power as it says in verse 19, the keys, the keys of the kingdom to be able to open and close. And so you can see now where they are able to hold the power over kings, over countries, over peoples by claiming this verse as their own. Okay, so they are able to say, all right, you won't become a Roman Catholic? I'm going to bind, I'm going to close heaven from you. But we're, we're going to go now. You know, going into purgatory isn't going to do any good because this heaven is closed. So the only place to go is hell. In other words, they're saying you can go to hell. If you don't become a Roman Catholic, go to hell. That's pretty, pretty hard, isn't it? It's true, isn't it, Paco? It's true. That's what they're saying. All right? And if you turn and you become a Roman Catholic, then welcome. You're on your way to heaven. Right. 
my pockets are feeling a bit light. But then you have to go through the sacraments. So the Roman Catholic Church believed then that by Peter, the Pope and his successors have been given the power to allow or disallow certain people from entering into heaven. They've been given that power. Which is pretty sad. Sad, really. What is the biblical explanation? So next week, we're, because we've run out of time this evening, we're going to look at what is the biblical explanation for this passage. Because obviously, it doesn't teach that. Peter himself and his doctrines and his teachings does not back up or match what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. So something is really, really wrong. Something is rotten. Smells like a rotten fish. If you know. Pagan. Yeah. The hat that the Pope wears smells like a rotten fish. Something's rotten. Okay? So there are a number of points, okay, that the Bible makes. There's a number of points that the Bible makes, and we're going to uh, look at that. So we'll close in prayer, and then we'll finish there.